Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of Red Sparks Crypto Blog for all your Cardano and crypto related news, analysis, and tutorials. Today, we will be talking about Aiken. No, not Aiken South Carolina or Aiken Promotions or even Aiken, the Malaysian skincare company. No, today we are talking about Aiken Cardano, a Cardano specific language written to make smart contract development a lot easier. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Aiken, it's a new programming language that was developed as it became obvious that programming in Haskell wasn't quite right, as they uh, rather diplomatically put it here. Um, the good thing about Aiken is that it takes inspiration from a lot of other well-known languages and really tries to get the best of every world into one package. So I'm quite excited about learning Aiken. Now, if you're like this person and thought Cardano smart contracts had to be written in Haskell, well, this is a common misconception. Um, the current Cardano node implementation does indeed happen to be written in Haskell. Oh, this is too technical. Let me just explain it to you. Um, Cardano uses something called the UPLC. Okay, this is what's actually used by Cardano smart contracts. Haskell simply just compiles down to UPLC. UPLC is something that you're not supposed to write by hand. If you're, you know, if you're, if you're a Java developer, you might kind of see it a little bit like Java bytecode, but even that's probably not quite right. Um, but in any case, Haskell compiles into UPLC, and you can have other languages compile into UPLC. UPLC does not need Haskell, okay? So that's why we're able to have a language such as Aiken. It's just another way of writing code in a language, and then the compiler will take that code and compile it down into UPLC. And I've seen some interesting benchmarks with Aiken and these other languages that are popping up, whereby they actually compile down into a much smaller, more efficient file than the official Haskell-based Plutus language, which I thought was quite, quite interesting. It's worth mentioning that Aiken is not a general purpose programming language, by which I mean you're not going to be able to build fancy um, web applications, websites from it. You still need other more established languages to do that. Aiken really focuses on Cardano, so really it's a domain specific language, specific to the domain of Cardano, and is intended to really make it easier to interact and, well, build and interact with Cardano smart contracts. Uh, so we'll, we'll get a better feel of all of that as we go through this tutorial. Now the tutorial we're going to cover um, is accessible from the main homepage, which is up here, um, by clicking on the Get Started button. And that'll take you to, through to the installation instructions, which we're going to cover um, on this page. Uh, and then we're going to skip through all of these pages and go straight to Hello World. That's not to say these pages aren't important, in particular the EUTXO crash course. Um, however, I decided I'm actually going to do a separate video on, the, on EUTXO, and I'm going to cover a lot of these concepts, because they're very fundamental concepts that are definitely worth knowing. Um, but for, for today's video, I'm just going to, as we go through the Hello World contract, uh, where there is a need to understand some of these concepts, I'll give you a little sprinkling of understanding for now. Uh, but as I said, there'll be a, a better, more in-depth video coming out on that uh, in the near future. Okay, so here we are on the installation page for Aiken, and there are several different methods here that you can use to install Aiken, of which the first method is really suitable if you're a Linux user. Um, I did manage to get it work on Windows using WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux. Um, I also tried PowerShell because Windows 10 and above does have the curl command built into it. However, I couldn't get very far beyond that. So if you do want to um, run it on Windows using the Linux command, then WSL is your best option. Uh, and obviously, if you have a, a Linux uh, computer to begin with, then you've got no problems at all. The second method, however, does work better, I think, for Windows users. Uh, Cargo is, uh, I think it's a compiler for Rust. Um, so to get Cargo, you have to install Rust first, or it's a package manager for Rust. Um, so do refer to the Rust book here to have that uh, set up and installed. And then after that, you can go ahead and run that. So I've already done that and things are looking good. The last option, Nix, 
just stay stay away from um i uh, from what i know of nix it's like a it's like a another operating system i think but it uses linux you, you install it on linux and then you run nix it's all very confusing i personally would just stay away from it um okay so i'm gonna bring up my uh windows terminal after i've done the whole cargo setup so here I am in my PowerShell terminal. I've actually got the latest version of PowerShell, PowerShell 7, which if you want that can be obtained from the PowerShell GitHub repo. And uh, for my Windows machine, I went for the 64-bit version uh, over here. Um, regular PowerShell should be fine as well, but I think if you're a heavy developer on Windows, you've probably got the latest version of PowerShell. Um, okay, so now I'm on the Hello World page over here, the tutorial. There is actually one other thing you need to install. Um, it's a prerequisite, at least for this tutorial. If you, I presume what's, what, what we're going to see is some web-based interface for the smart contract that we build. Um, and they're using Dino here. Dino is a TypeScript server. It's actually pretty cool in, in the world of JavaScript and TypeScript. It's actually kind of cool new kid on the block. Um, w worth learning about in any case. Um, so I'm kind of <laughs> glad to see it mentioned here. Um, okay, so yeah, so make sure you follow this link and got uh, Dino installed as well. Okay, so to create a new Akin project, you type in Akin new, followed by a user, so this could be anything you want, followed by hello world. So I'm just going to copy that over here paste that in and I shall replace this bit with red spark. Okay, enter that uh, and that's now created a sort of skeleton of a project uh, and we can CD into that to see what it looks like. Uh, there we go. Um, and it basically reflects what we have over here. So um, there is an akin.toml file, which is like a configuration file. The validators folder here, which is where you store the on-chain code, uh, so basically the smart contract, and then a separate folder for all the non-on-chain stuff, and we'll see the distinction about that uh, later on, uh, but here it's created for us an empty Hello World directory. Um, and here's that uh, Akin TOML file that I mentioned, the uh, configuration file over there, um, so pretty standard stuff. Uh, and then this bit's important, after you've created your brand new project, it's worth just running Akin check. Now you have to be in the folder that you uh, uh, created your um, project of. So I am now in my hello world folder. And oops, uh, Akin check, there we go. Um, and then that gives me back zero errors and zero warnings. So that's great. Okay, for this next section, what I'm actually going to do is pause and play you back something that I previously created in my last video, but it's a real good introduction to what validators are. So if you're uh, not familiar with it or you haven't seen my previous video, I um, would suggest staying on. If you have seen it, then you can skip over this very next section. Before we begin, I thought it'd be helpful to give you a quick overview of how uh, transactions and smart contracts work on Cardano. So if you imagine you're using your favorite DEX and you want to transfer uh, you know, one token for another, uh, your, the front end of your DEX will be the transaction builder. It will convert your instruction into a transaction that the Cardano blockchain can understand. And then that transaction would get submitted to a stake pool. Um, and that stake pool will take your instruction. But before it carries out your instruction to move funds around, it has to check whether you, what you're asking it to do is actually allowed. Now, should it be doing what you're asking it to do? It's not going to know, obviously, by itself. What it does is it refers to the script or the smart contract, aka the validator that you have um, referenced in the transaction. Um, and it's saying to the validator, here you go, here is a transaction that somebody wants to carry, uh, carry out. Can you tell me whether or not I should process this? And so the on-chain portion of this entire sort of smart contract process, the on-chain script is simply evaluating your transaction and giving a yay or a nay, a, you know, yes or a no, whether or not you're allowed 
to do that. And that's why that part of it is stored on chain, because that is the, the logic that you don't want anyone, anyone to tamper with. Um, whereas the transaction building side, um, you know, that, that can be, you know, anybody can create any transaction. It doesn't matter. You might be thinking, well, what if somebody creates a fake transaction and says they want to move money out of my account? Well, that's why the validator is so important. The validator will be checking, uh, in that case, will be checking the credentials and the signatures to make sure only authorized people are constructing the transaction that you're wanting to do. So that's why the validator is so important. Um, and that's why a smart contract on Cardano can sometimes be called a validator. It's just checking the various information you'll get, the transaction is giving it, and it's just simply saying yes or no. Um, and then that gets returned to the stake pool. And if the stake pool gets a yes, it'll carry out the transaction. If it gets a no, it won't carry out the transaction. Okay, so hopefully you found that useful. Uh, and hopefully now this makes a bit more sense. So this is gonna be in the validators folder and it's gonna be our very first file, hello world.ak, AK for Akin. Um, and I actually went away and I created that file using Notepad whilst you were watching that little segment. Um, so we're looking here at the smart contract. This is our first sight of what Akin looks like as a programming language. So you see it has various sort of use statements which are very familiar to most languages. You know, you're either importing or using. You're basically bringing in external libraries that you're gonna need or good. I'll come back to these two in a second. And then you have your actual smart contract, this validator here. This is the smart contract logic. Uh, and as I said in the video just now, um, the validator is simply giving a binary yes or no. That's what it evaluates into. So you see it evaluating into a Boolean yes, no there, and that's what it's going to return. And it's going to do that by taking in some inputs, doing some logic on that, and then returning the output of that logic. The uh, inputs that it's taking in, one is the datum uh, over here and the other is a redeemer and then this context um, variable as well. The datum is essentially um, a, just a piece of data that you lock with the funds when the contract, well, when you're funding the contract. So as mentioned here, the datum is set when locking funds in the contract and can be therefore seen as configuration. In my mind, I kind of see it as short term memory. It you know it captures some information at the time that you locked funds up into that contract, um, and then uh, the redeemer again. Uh, so the, so in this case, the datum we've specified for this particular example to be a signature. Uh, in particular, the signature of the owner. Uh, that's what we've got over here. And then the redeemer we are saying is just going to be a byte array, which is essentially just string. The reason why we have that is the redeemer is going to be essentially just another variable that, the, that we're going to demand the user gives us. Um, it's a variable that has to be there. Every Cardano uh, validator has to have these three things, but how we use them is up to us. So in this case, we're saying that the redeemer must come with a message, um, this, this byte array, and that message has to be hello world. So we're asking whoever is requesting these, uh, th that this script uh, gives a, a true value uh, for their transaction, whoever is requesting that, then they at least need to say hello world to us using this parameter, and they need to provide um, their signature into this variable as well and then we have the rule that have they said hello world so this will equate or get converted into a boolean true false and that will get stored here and has the signature that they've given us which was ob obtained from here the signature of the person who created the transaction does that match the signature of the owner of the signature that was provided at the time that the UTXO was locked with this uh, smart contract. Um, so, and, and I, I realize I have to explain that sentence better <laughs> later on in the video, and I will. But uh, since you've got two, two um, pieces of logic there, um, 
And what, what this list has is checking is does, could, because a transaction could be signed by multiple parties, it's saying does any of these signatures match the owner of the UTXO? And then again, this whole thing equates to a true or false and is stored in here. And then finally, we are returning the combination of this. So if this is true and this is true, the overall thing will return a true. But if one of them is a false, then this will equate to a false. And that's how the, the logic of this validator works. You have to be polite to it and you have to be the owner of the funds that was used to lock, you know, when, when the funds were locked into the script. Okay, so now I'm going to convert this script into uh, from something that's human readable into something that's machine readable by using Aiken build over here. Um, so I'm going to go out of the validators folder back into the main folder. The validators folder is where I've stored this file. But let's just go back up. And then I'm going to type in Aiken build. And now that's going to compile it. And then thankfully, there's no errors there, which is all good. Um, what that has done is created a Plutus JSON file. So let's take a quick look at that because I haven't actually seen that yes, yet. Uh, there's a Pluton, Plutus.json file. I'll work that into Notepad. Let's see if that's readable at all. Okay, so this is something that's both human readable, i.e. it's ASCII text, and machine readable in that it is it looks like a JSON structured object. And as it's all said over here, this file format is designed to be language agnostic. It's meant to sort of allow greater interoperability between different languages. Um, so it's almost like a standardized metadata about your contract. And then over here we have the hash of our script. If you're not familiar with hashes, it's a computational method for deriving a unique fingerprint about any file. So in this case, what the build um, compiler did was take this file and derived this set of numbers and characters as being a unique fingerprint. If you change even one comma or one character or add an extra dot or anything at all about this file and regenerate, you will end up with a completely different hash. Uh, so that's a great thing about hashes is that it can take any large file of any size and you can from that derive a unique fingerprint that's a lot smaller to sort of store than the original file itself. But you can't necessarily go back from this back into this. So it's a one way type of sort of transaction. And that's great for cryptographic needs of various sort. Now, I want to better explain what this script is trying to do. Um, I'm going to give a very simplistic explanation here. As I said, I'll do a more deep dive on this in a separate video. But essentially, when you are first setting up your contract, uh, so, you know, we've written out the script and we've built it, but we haven't sent it to the chain. But when we do send it to the chain, we're going to execute our transaction. Everything on Cardano happens through transactions. And we're going to send it our script and some amount of ADA. OK, that's what this UTXO represents. And both the script and the ADA will be locked up at an address. That address corresponds to the hash of this script. So this, uh, so the hash that we, we just calculated is actually our Cardano address. That will then be used to store both the amount of ADA that we're locking up at this address and a reference copy of the actual script as well. OK, now when it comes to redeeming or, you know, you want to get back this um, UTXO, that's when the script is consulted. The script is that validator, uh, that policeman giving a yes or a no as to whether you're allowed to take away this UTXO. Um, and that's where that logic that we saw comes into it, where you have to say uh, hello world and you have to, in the case of that script that we just looked at, you also have to um, be the owner of this UTXO. So if your signature is attached to this UTXO, you're the one that put it into here in the first place, then you're allowed to redeem it. So signature is number one and hello world is number two. That hello world, by the way, that also happens through, let me just move forward, through datums. So datum is basically a piece of data that is attached 
to the UTXO at the time that you're putting it into, well, through this transaction and into the address. So that datum is stored. And it could be anything we like, anything at all. So you know, it really depends on how you how you code it. So the way we've coded it in the example just now is that this datum says hello world. And then when whoever creates another transaction, try and redeem it. Not only are we checking that they they are the owner of this transaction, we're seeing if they if they give a message that matches what they had put in into this box at the time that they initially created it, at the time they initially loaded this UTXO into this script, okay? Okay, so that's what we see going on in this script here. If somebody wishes to remove this UTXO from back out of this address, they're going to have to provide, or the transaction that was constructed on their behalf, will have to provide a datum, a redeemer, and the script context, which basically points to this script here. Um, actually, looking at this, um, in this particular example, um, it's actually uh, the datum is playing the role of capturing the signature um, of the person who created the UTXO. So that's what's being stored in the datum. And the redeemer value is simply hard coded into here. So let's go through the logic again one more time. Um, we're saying that if the message that was given to us by the transaction equals this hard coded message of hello world, so we're not having to store that in the data term or remember it, we're literally hard coding it, then this will be true. And if the signature of the person requesting the transaction or one of the many signatures that could, could be in this transaction, if any of those signatures match what we have stored in our variable, our little short-term memory, um, uh, if it matches the owner, then that will equate to true. So if both those things are true, the whole overall thing is true, and therefore the person who's requesting this transaction to retrieve this UTXO will have their wish granted by that policeman, and they will then be able to ex uh, remove this UTXO from the contract. All of that logic does not have to happen when you're populating UTXOs into a contract. Um, it's you know it's free to enter, or there's, there's no barrier to entry. You can keep loading up lots and lots of uh, ADA into this contract. It's only when you want to remove uh, UTXOs back out of a script address does this script logic suddenly kick in. Okay, moving on, uh, and I hope you appreciate it. I made the text a little bit bigger for you. Um, we are now going to get some testnet ADA uh, that we can play around with. Um, and the way we're going to do that is first we run this file here, which is a TypeScript file. This is where Dino kicks in. Um, so I've actually created that file and ran it. Uh, it's fairly painless, and it generated for me a, a testnet address uh, stored in this uh, file here. Um, and now I can go over to the Cardano faucet, which I have open over here. Um, so this is where, when you're building your Cardano scripts, you can get some testnet ADA to play around with, and then at the end of playing around with it, you can always return it back to the faucet. Testnet ADA is not worth anything. It's just used for testing, but there is a limited amount, so it's polite to then return it back to the address that you got it from. Okay, so... Um, you select preview testnet here. There's other types of testnet, but preview testnet. We want to receive a, a test ADA. That's the address that just got generated for me that I just got from this key address file. And I am definitely not a robot, so let's request funds. Um, da -da 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 -da. Okay, success. Good. That'll take a little while to come through, but then that address will be populated. Uh, let's now continue. Um, oh, and we couldn't even go to Cardano Scan if you wanted to. And, switch over to the testnet ADA to see that coming in. Um, uh, switch over to the testnet network, I should say, to, to see that coming in. Now, I want to explain that we wrote code in Aiken, and Aiken compiled down to UPLC. That's kind of the main function of Aiken. It's to allow you to write in a language other than Haskell and have it validated and compiled out into something that the Cardano blockchain can interpret. That's what's known as the on-chain code. Aiken doesn't focus on what we call the off-chain code. So the actual code that will deploy your 
contract, your smart contract or your validator to the blockchain, that's not going to be aching. All the code that will then um, interact with that um, smart contract once it's on the blockchain. So we'll generate a transaction and then send that transaction to the, your, your contract and get a response back. Um, that will not be Aiken. Aiken is really just the actual validation logic, that U, uh, UPLC file that gets deployed on chain. So to construct a transaction, in this case, we want to construct a transaction that will now deploy our Aiken based UPLC file that we've just built that will deploy that onto the blockchain. For that, we will actually use Lucid and Blockfrost. By the way, if you were watching what I said earlier about the you know UTXOs and all that, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, I, I get you can uh, create a script that takes a UTXO out. How do I build something complicated? How do I do complex logic? I will cover, I'll come back to that later. That is a very important point uh, worthy of a whole discussion um, and, and probably something I'll cover in more depth in a separate video. But I want you to know that I am very well aware that that thought could be going through your mind right now. So please don't <laughs> tune off for, for this uh, section. Now, uh, I mentioned Lucid and Blockfoss. There are other tools that you can also use um, if you go to this website here. Um, you'll see there's a whole world of Cardano sort of um, projects um, offering all sorts of capabilities. This is probably more advanced level. Um, I think as a beginner, really, you just want to stick to Lucid and Brockfoss, which are very well established. Um, OK, so for the next uh, couple of steps, there's essentially a Hello World uh, lock file that we're building out. Um, where you go through and you copy all of this into a single file. Um, a key thing to mention, um, up near the top, where it says Blockfrost API key, this means uh, go get your Blockfrost key from, and there's a link down right at the bottom here. So you sign up using this account. Um, and uh, let's just go to that page for a second. Okay, so I have logged in. Uh, let's go find my projects, wherever they are. Dashboard, perhaps. Here we go. So that's the um, key I generated earlier, and I used the Cardano Preview uh, network when I did it. Um, I'll delete this API key after this video so others can't misuse it. Um, but that's the key that I generated earlier. Now that key does not go directly, now scroll all the way back up, uh, does not go directly into here. It's actually, and this is something I hadn't noticed initially, it's an environment variable. So. Um, if you're a Windows user, that means you put that into your environment uh, option. So let's bring that up. OK, so up here I have the command that you would use to add the Blockfrost API key to your Windows environment. If you're using Linux, you just replace this with export, I believe, but double check that. Uh, so let me just press enter on that. So that's now been added. Um, OK, and so then we can proceed with the rest of the script. What I'm going to do is add all of this to a single hello world lock ts file so there's i think three sections here to add um, and then i'm going to run this so i'll be back in just a second okay so i had a slight mishap which i'm going to share with you as i think it's a good learning lesson um, so i did manage to run the dino code up here and it did give me uh, my or did lock up my ada into the contract so all good um, but as part of putting together this tutorial i ended up rerunning the code that generates the public and private key, uh, the, the address that I was using to receive my testnet ADA. What that means is two things. One is because I no longer have access to the private key that I use to lock my funds into my script address, I won't be able to unlock those funds anymore. So that testnet ADA is sadly gone. And because I have uh, a new, uh, new, new key, a new address, I went back to the faucet to try and get some more testnet ADA so I can repeat this exercise for the purposes of this tutorial, but I'm rate limited. So I guess it's checking my IP address and seeing how many times I request testnet ADA. So I'm gonna have to wait, I don't know if it's an hour or a day or what, um, but I'm gonna have to wait until I can get that testnet ADA back. But it's good for you guys to know that when you're developing. Um, in hindsight, I guess what I should have done is kept a copy or a backup of my private key uh, in, in case this happened. 
Um, even though it's all just Tesla ADA, I haven't lost any real ADA. But in any case, I will continue this um, tutorial um, and uh, just go through explaining the, the what we just ran. And hopefully I'll be able to regain some Tesla ADA to complete this tutorial. So the hello world lock file is what submits our validator to the blockchain. So it constructs a transaction and submits that transaction. The first part of the script looks fairly straightforward. I don't think you'd ever have to change that, no matter what transaction you were building. Um, I think all of this would remain. And as we mentioned earlier, you would make sure your uh, machine has your um, Blockfoss API key. The second section of code, um, this also I think wouldn't change either. Um, there is some code here that will be reading your private key, the, the key that I messed up earlier. Um, and then it's just creating a validator object, which will then read the all important Plutus.json file. Remember, this is a kind of a metadata file about your contract. So that will get read into this validator object. So all of this, I think, you know, you, you just leave as is. Okay, and now this final bit is where it gets a bit more interesting. Um, we're first getting our public key using this utility function here. Um, it's actually the hash of the public key. Um, and, and this is what we are going to be putting into the datum, as we talked about earlier. Um, that datum required, I think, was a byte array. Uh, yep. And that's why I've got those little array marks around that to turn it into an array. Um, I wasn't as familiar with this uh, constructor, exactly how that works or what it does. But it seems to be what's needed to put it into what's in the format needed for the datum. So I imagine you know, going forward, you might change this. You might change the array, but I don't think there should be a need to change the rest of this constructor. Um, every time you lock um, uh, anything into a contract, you need to provide one ADA. That's a minimum amount that a, a, um, a contract needs to have. Um, so that's what's happening here. So we are locking up one ADA into our validator, into our script file, and we're also passing along the datum that we created. Um, and then all of that is an await, so that means it's asynchronous. Asynchronous means um, it'll just continue. Actually, well, it won't continue. The opposite in this case. It's going to uh, wait for this to complete. Um, and then once it's completed, it will give a transaction ha hash. Um, and so long story short, once that has all been processed, um, you will end up with this console message just summarizing it, saying, hey, one ADA has been locked up in this uh, script address. Remember, the hash of the whole validator is your script address. So one ADA is now locked up at this address with this piece of datum, which is your the hash of your public key. Um, and then you've got some utility functions here, supporting functions, which I, I won't go through, um, but essentially they helped us do these transactions. And then you run that using this command here. And then, as I said, you should end up with having one ADA locked up at that contract. Um, and I guess if you want to lock up more than one ADA, you would uh, change this amount here. By the way, this is in Lovelaces. So everything you do in Cardano at this level is actually in Lovelaces. There's one million Lovelace um, for one ADA, um, or one million Lovelaces equals one ADA. So if you change this to five at the beginning, you'll lock up five ADA and so on, okay? Now you can actually see this transaction uh, on the Cardano blockchain by going to a chain explorer like cardanoscan.io. There's quite a few of them around, but this is quite a popular one. Uh, and what you wanna do is you wanna just change this from mainnet to preview, uh, because that's what we've been using for our tutorial. Um, and we wanna search for our transaction hash up here. Um, and then this brings up our transaction. Um, very high level, there's, there's actual hash, the time that it was carried out on, the specific block and the specific uh, slot that this transaction was carried out in. Uh, come back to this output here in a second. Here's the fees that was paid. And then down here you have a summary of the transaction. So 1.2 ADA went from this address to this address. 
So we can presume that this address ending in FET was the address that contained the testnet ADA and that this is the script address that is receiving the ADA. Now I know our tutorial said we're sending over one ADA. So what does this say 1.2? Well, there's always a, a small transaction fee. And I think there's a few, um, uh, yeah, the transaction fee and possibly some collateral or something else in there as well. But that will get you to your 1.2. Now this summary only shows you the ADA movement and nothing else. If you go to the second tab, you see a more detailed view of that transaction. So this is the address that sent the ADA. Um, and this is the prior transaction that actually led to the creation of, of this address or this UTXO. Um, and you see that it sent 9,900, not, not the uh, 1.2 ADA that you saw there, 9,900. So you might be wondering why, <laughs> why is it showing that instead of the one ADA? That's because with UTXOs, whenever you send a UTXO, you're sending everything in that UTXO. You're not somehow dividing that UTXO into two and only sending half of it or a third of it. You're sending the whole thing. So if that UTXO just happens to contain 9,989 and you don't have any other smaller UTXOs, then that's what you're going to send. And then the transaction will send back to you the change that's left over, which is what you're getting here. That's coming back to the FET address and the script is getting the 1.03. So the transaction fee is taken out. And now notice this little icon over here. Click on that. This now also shows you the datum that was attached um, to this um, transact, well, to this script. So the end result is that this script address has 1.034 and it also has this datum that was given. The bottom one is the actual data. Uh, so that should match up to, oops, not there, but over here, this bottom half here. And then uh, the top bit is just a hash of the, the datum. So that's what's stored there. Okay, let's go back to the tutorial. Okay, we're at the home stretch now, almost done. Now that we've locked up the ADA in the script, it could be a day later, it could be a month later, we now want to unlock that ADA from that script or from that address. Um, how do we do that? Well, we know we have to create a transaction that says hello world and has to be signed by the same person that put the ADA in there to begin with, which was obviously us. Okay, those are the two criteria that the validator policeman looks out for. Uh, and if we can satisfy that, I'll give us a thumbs up and we can get our ADA back. So we're gonna create a new file, hello world-unlock.ts. The first half of the file is boilerplate code. You'll recognize a lot of it from earlier. So as I said earlier, you shouldn't have to change it when you do a new transaction. So it stays pretty much the same. The one thing I want to point out is we do reference that same metadata file here about the, the contract itself. And so we then end up with this validator object. And then the second half of the, um, of the script, well, first of all, before we can get to this part here, let me just show you when you run this, what it looks like. When you run this, you're running this command, there's your file, and then you're passing in the transaction ID of the transaction that we just ran just now uh, when that ADA was locked up, okay? So now let's go back up here. So this is pulling in that transaction uh, ID and storing it in the TX hash variable. And then we're also uh, got a, a hard-coded zero here for the output index. What that basically means is that in our transaction, we only locked up or sent over one uh, UTXO, uh, um, well, yeah, one UTXO to be locked up. Let me just bring up the visual again, just to aid with that. So one script address has this one UTXO that we put in there. So when we say zero, we're referring to that. This will never be referred to. This is a special type of UTXO. But you could have a situation where you actually put in more than one UTXO into the script address. In that case, this will be zero, that will be one, that will be two, and so on, okay? So that's why this is a zero. Um, and then that basically gives us this UTXO object. That is pointing to um, this guy here. This is what we want to unlock, okay? 
We also have a redeemer, which in this tutorial is literally just hello world, uh, but converted into a format that the redeemer can sort of uh, store, it, store it in and pass it through in. So that's all this conversion happening over here. Um, and then we have, let's see, oh, this is the actual, uh, the code that actually carries out the transaction. Um, so the unlock code here will unlock uh, the, the UTXO. You're giving it the UTXO that you want to unlock. You're giving it your validator, your script essentially up here uh, that contains the logic. Now you might be thinking, well, why am I sending the validator? Surely I could give it a fake validator that says that I'm good to go. Well, that's why we've stored a, a reference of the validator here. And we also have the hash address here. So what the um, staple operator will do on their end when they get this validator is they'll hash it up and they'll just confirm that this matches with the address here. That's how I understand it at least. So there's no way you can cheat the system essentially. Um, and then it's passing that redeemer along as well. All of that gets processed and if it passes the rules, gets a thumbs up, the transaction uh, executes and happens and then you get a summary down here as we did before. And then you should see an output that looks like this. And that's it. That is the end of the Hello World tutorial. So congratulations if you've got this far. And that's effectively the end of the tutorial. But gather around the campfire, there are two thoughts I want to leave you with. The first is this distinction between the on-chain code and the off-chain code. So the on-chain code is effectively just that validator, that little policeman or policewoman that is sitting there on the blockchain giving you the thumbs up or thumbs down for any transaction you want to carry out. Obviously, it's very important that the validator code is on the blockchain where it cannot be changed. But it's also important that that code is designed properly, that it doesn't have any weak points. Um, and that's why that critical bit of code is done using UPLC. And any language that wants to write it has to essentially compile, compile down to UPLC. And UPLC was designed to really limit the amount of things you can do to make it easier to, um, to check the code. Um, and so that's where the higher amount of security comes into it. The, the fact that UPLC doesn't have free ranging access to do anything uh, that it wants, uh, as you might do with a more uh, broader programming language. The off-chain code, however, um, is a bit freer. You, I mean, with the off-chain code, so we, we used it here to construct transactions, two transactions. The first transaction submitted our on-chain code onto the chain, and the second transaction then interacted with that on-chain code. Now, you can assume that off-chain code could be written by anybody, because it can. Anybody could write off-chain code, and you can assume it could even be a bad actor. This is why getting the on-chain validator logic is so important. As long as the on-chain um, logic is tight, then a bad actor should not be able to get through the defenses. Now, the off-chain code would actually just be the code that, let's say, when you go, when you go to a website for a particular Cardano project, that website will be running code that generates a transaction it will then send that transaction to your wallet to sign. That's when that wallet thing pops up. So all of that is off-chain code happening. Um, and then that transaction gets sent on-chain for the validator to sort of uh, verify. Um, so in reality, the off-chain code will be controlled. You know, if you're going to a reputable website, will be controlled uh, by the uh, owner of that project. And so hopefully it should be correct. Um, I mean, that still doesn't mean that they may have made a mistake on the on-chain code and all sorts of things could go wrong. So, you know, you still need to make sure you audit that. Um, but th that's where that off-chain code will be. And in this tutorial, we didn't see any of the website side of things. But the, you know, the fact that the off-chain code was written in TypeScript, and TypeScript is a web language, means it's not a stretch of the imagination to 
uh, code up a website that lets you, instead of uh, typing in the transaction address that we so, uh, typed in manually into Dino there at the end, there will be other ways of identifying that transaction um, and retrieving um, the, the amount that you locked. Um, so this is where you get all quite, you know, quite creative with how you structure your off-chain code. Now that off-chain code also is centralized. It's going to be running on, if it's Sunday swap code, a Sunday swap server, and so on. Um, so that's the centralized portion of a smart contract, whereas the on-chain is decentralized. It's not controlled by anybody once it's been deployed. Okay, enough on on-chain versus off-chain. Last thing, design patterns. I said halfway through, I said, hey, you might be thinking right now, wait a minute, you just show me how I lock something into a script and how to unlock it. Okay, how do I do something more complex? The thing is, let me just go back a slide uh, over here. At its bare bone, the uh, Cardano sort of uh, model has the following key things. It has the ability to provide inputs into a process. It has ability uh, to carry out logic in, in that transaction bubble using UPLC. So whatever you know, UPLC allows, you can do that logic in there. Uh, it has the ability to then also output, you know, just like if you wrote a mathematical function or a programming function, it has the ability to output a result. Um, and it also has the ability to carry data in the form of that datum along with it, in addition to uh, ADA and in addition to other tokens. That's a lot of things in the toolkit, a lot of different things you can play with. And you should be able to, using this basic mechanism of input output, hence the name, I suppose, of IOHK, um, using that basic mechanism, you can actually do anything you could do in any other language. That's, I think, been proved mathematically. But this is where, des oh, go back here, design patterns comes into it. So there is another example on the Akin tutorial, which takes you one step further. It's called the vesting contract. I might do a tutorial video on that next potentially, but I highly recommend reading through that as that takes you one step further along the journey and introduces, I think, the concept of time-based contracts. But that basically sort of you know, shows you how, as you want to develop more and more complicated contracts, the hard bit isn't which language you code in. As you saw, it's actually fairly easy. Like the validator logic, bish, bash, bosh, pretty much. You know, there isn't much you really have to think about um, for actually writing the bare bones validator logic or even the off-chain code. No, the hard bit is visualizing in your head what and how, how what you want to achieve would look like in code, the design patterns. If you're doing a DEX and you want to do a swap, how are you going to use this structure to do a swap? What would that look like? Um, if you want to do um, liquid staking, etc., or borrowing and lending, etc., etc., all these things require figuring out what will what would the process, the design pattern, not just the on-chain validation, but also the off-chain piece as well, how that would all look like. Um, and that's something I think we need to do a better job of. And this is why open sourcing uh, code will also help um, as it will show people um, how other people approached it. But I think more importantly, we also need to have more material out there just explaining design patterns agnostic of any particular language, like, you know, possibly even just sort of visuals like this, just to help people think through how they would solve different types of problems um, in the best possible way. So next steps, do have a look at the vesting contract. Do have a look at other tutorials from other uh, domain-specific languages as well. You may pick up new things there. Because at the end of the day, as, a, as I so hopefully put across, it really doesn't matter which language you pick here, whichever one you're most comfortable with. Um, they're all doing the same sort of thing. Uh, they're, one half is creating the actual validation script and the other half is creating the transaction code. Uh, to, to then submit transactions. But it's just those design patterns that you need to really start to develop if you want to kind of 
progressed from beginner to intermediate to advanced. Um, and the Aiken website does have some other material on there, more advanced topics. Again, maybe I'll cover it once I've reached Jedi status. Um, but I do recommend checking it out. Okay, hope you enjoyed this video. Hope my voice did not bore you. Uh, if you did like it, give me a thumbs up. Uh, hit subscribe if you haven't already. And follow me on Twitter if you want to keep up to date on my daily ramblings. Other than that, I hope you all have a great day.